We are coming to the conclusion of our series that we've called The Powers That Be. And we've talked about how the government serves a very vital and important purpose in the world. We've talked about how sometimes it is important to speak truth to power and that we need to be willing and able to do that. We've talked about the individual Christian's responsibility to be good citizens in whatever government that we happen to be governed by and whatever citizen of what country we may be uh, of. Uh, But today I want to talk about something that is wonderful. I want to talk about something that's great. I'm going to talk about, I want to talk this morning about the government to come, the one that's coming, the one that we've been praying for for 2,000 plus years. And the title of this message comes from our text, and be turning, if you will, to Isaiah 9, the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now that's a wonderful phrase, and we're going to look at this passage of Scripture, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, and we're going to draw out from this passage of Scripture the aspects of the king and the aspects of the kingdom. Let's read together. Isaiah 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice, from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Dear Father, I pray that you'd help us to grasp the wonder of this passage of Scripture and apply it to our lives. Lord, may we live daily with the confidence that there's something coming that is wonderful because your word has promised it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Shall be. That's a wonderful part of this passage of Scripture. I have underlined it here in my notes, shall be. I like what it says, the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now, we've talked about what has been. We've talked about what is now. But I really like talking about what shall be. Because the Bible says this is coming. It is going to happen just as surely as anything else has happened, just as surely as any other Bible prophecy has come true, and many already have. This is, you can take this to the bank. This is solid. Shall be. And this phrase, the government shall be upon his shoulder. I love Handel's Messiah, and I love the music, I love the wording, I love the crescendo, I love everything about it. Uh, and, And I'll also understand, I love the King James Version of the Scripture, but I know there's a comma somewhere where most people believe a comma shouldn't be. And you understand that in the original Scriptures, the punctuation wasn't there. When it was put into English, the punctuation came in, and sometimes they get it just perfect, other times maybe not. But I want you to notice there's a comma between the word wonderful and counselor. And I love uh, Handel's Messiah because his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Now listen, his name is wonderful, and Jesus is wonderful, but all of these things about Jesus have an adjective that have a qualifier. And so we're going to learn today what those are. Now this idea of shall be, uh, that the government will be by and through the Lord Jesus Christ as Messiah. One day, not only this country, but the entire world all the nations of the world will have Jesus Christ as their one true king, and he will be the seat of government. So Jesus Christ will be the ruler, and this is the kingdom that shall come. And so as we look at this particular text, we we see there's the general truth given that uh, there shall come a kingdom, and the kingdom will be Jesus. But I want us to look at the details of it, the description of it, so that we get a, a, a good idea of it. Now, there's two aspects to this passage of Scripture. First of all, there's the description of the king, and then there's the description of the kingdom. Now, first, let's look at the description of the king. Let's look at that. Now, the description of the kingdom is going to follow the nature and the personality of the king. Uh, In olden times, uh, where they had a monarchy, and when when I say a monarchy, there are monarchies today, but they're not really monarchies. A monarchy means this, one ruler, and the king was law. Uh, Now, England has a king, used to have a queen, but they only have so much power. They're basically ceremonial. 
uh, they have to ask permission for, for what they do from the parliament. Uh, so that is a, a parliamentarian monarchy, if you want to call it that. But in times past, uh, they had monarchies that were exactly that, where the king was the ruler, and he's the one that judged uh, court matters. He was the one that decided policy. He was the one that uh, levied taxes, and it was him. Now, the, the good thing about that is when you had a good king. The bad thing about that is when you had a bad king. Think about it. A monarchy is a pretty efficient form of government. Uh, for one thing, you've only got a, a smaller amount of people to, to pay from the treasury rather than having two houses of Congress and a Supreme Court and un, uh, innumerable bureaus to deal with. Uh, so it's efficient that way. Plus, there, it, things can be done quicker. Uh, you don't have to wait on an act of Congress to be passed to get things done. So there's a lot of advantages in a monarchy. The only problem is it when you have a bad king. So here's the thing. The only person in the world that ever lived that has absolutely the right to be king and would be a perfect king is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is perfect, and therefore he will be a good king. So let's look at what the Bible says about him. First of all, he is described here as a wonderful counselor. So he is not only personally wonderful, he is a doer of wonders, and in particular, it has to do with being a counselor. Now that means someone that you go to for wisdom, someone you go to for advice, someone you go to to find out what you should learn and what you should do. That is who Jesus is. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 3, we find this said about Jesus, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Jesus is the ultimate source of wisdom and knowledge. He is the book of Psalms. He is the book of Proverbs, all put together and more. Every wise thing that was ever said, every, every wise thing that was ever believed, Jesus Christ is the head of it, and he is the source of it. So he is the wonderful counselor. Now, I have had uh, the, the, uh, the duty at times as a pastor uh, to provide counsel. Uh, I always tried to make sure that my counsel was based on the Word of God, because that's the source of wisdom, not my opinion. And if I had an opinion, I would share that, and I would say, this is just what I think, and I want you to take this with a grain of salt. But when I go to the Word of God, this is God speaking, this is counsel. Uh, and here's the thing, the, the, the truth of God, the wisdom of God is powerful. It changes lives. It makes people better. It heals marriages. It heals relationships between parents and children. It makes people more functional in the world. Counsel is a wonderful thing to have. Jesus is described as having wisdom and knowledge. Romans chapter 11 verse 33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. This is the reference to our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is called the Wonderful Counselor. Then we come to this one. He's not only the Wonderful Counselor, he is the Mighty God. Now there's a branch of so-called Christianity. I don't believe it's true Christianity. But there's a branch of Christianity that they refer to themselves as Christians, and yet they do not believe that Jesus was God in the flesh. They do not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. They say he was just a man, a particularly gifted man, a particularly anointed man, they may even say, uh, but they do not put him in the same category as God himself, where the Bible here presents the king that is coming to set up the world, and there's none other than Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He's referred to here in Scripture as the mighty God. Listen, Jesus is God Almighty. John chapter 1, verse 1 says this, In the beginning was the Word, capital W-O-R-D, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It could not be clearer. But then you look further down and it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So this is a reference to our Savior Jesus Christ. He was and is the mighty God. Then we have the next one the everlasting Father. Now, while it's true that there is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, 
we also know that Jesus is the Father of all those who come to Jesus by faith. We are born again through His blood, and Jesus is the wisdom of the Father. At one point, one of the, His listeners said, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And He says, do you not know that if you have seen Me, you have seen the Father? So Jesus is the, the everlasting Father. As Messiah, Jesus will be a Father to all who love Him. And then this wonderful phrase, the Prince of Peace. That is, He is the ruler of peace. He is the power of peace. You know, back in the 60s and early 70s, you had the hippies, right? Uh, some of you were hippies. Uh, it'd be interesting to see your photo albums. I'd, I'd like to see uh, how you dressed. Uh, you know, I actually had a, a wide white belt and a pair of red pants and sandals and things like that back in the day in the 70s. And, you know, I tried to run around with that crowd for a little bit until I got straightened out. But one thing about the hippies, they were all the same. Peace, brother, peace. Everything was peace. You remember that? And they have the, the van go by, you know, and they had the peace signs on it, peace. Uh, but listen, you're not going to have peace without the Prince of Peace. Uh, and, and that's why I came to Jesus Christ, because it is through Him we find peace, joy, and love. The things that people were looking for, the, the things that people were searching for, are all found in Jesus Christ. He is the Prince of Peace. And this world is not going to have peace without the Prince of Peace. You know how they're going to settle the Middle East question? Jesus, the Jew, is going to come down and sit on the Jewish throne in a Jewish capital, in a Jewish state, and run the world from a Jewish capital, uh, and that's going to settle it. Uh, and that's going to fix it forever. We can't settle it until Jesus comes. He's going to make it happen. So we've got the description of the king. Now let's look at the description of the kingdom. And it's interesting as we look in the, each aspect of this. Uh, notice it says here, the, the increase of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Now that's an interesting phrase, the increase of his government. Now that word uh, is, a, is a, an important word. It's the word marbe. It is a Hebrew word, marbe. And it has to do with, with growing, swelling, elevating, increasing, uh, or just greatness. But it has to do with this, a growing greatness, uh, an increasing greatness. In other words, his kingdom is going to grow. His kingdom and the greatness of his kingdom will expand. Now that's an interesting thing because you think about it, uh, how is it going to expand? How is it going to be more and more? Well, the idea of it is it will be evolving as uh, nations uh, become more and more conf conformed to his will. But during the millennium, there will be a population explosion. There won't be war. There won't be disease. There won't be all the things that take people's lives. There will be prosperity. There will be great times. And so I, it is my belief, as we understand the Word of God, that during the millennium, there will be people on this earth who will be able to live in prosperity and peace. Uh, and, and you can just imagine with all the food problems solved and all the natural disasters abated and all the things that, that limit human life today, what a population explosion there can be for a thousand years. And you see it will increase. And even beyond that, it will increase for all eternity. And God understands how that's going to happen. We have, it will increase. It implies a growing kingdom, and it gives a little hint to us that there will be more and more subjects to his kingdom as time goes by. Also, it will be peaceful, his government and his peace. It will be a peaceful government. The only way for peace to be obtained is to remove the people who won't let peace happen. Even Jesus knows that. Jesus is not going to come down and debate. He's not going to come down and arbitrate. He's not going to come down and bribe. He's not going to come down and appease. He's going to come down and destroy. The Bible says that he will come on a white horse and he will have a vesture dipped in blood and in righteousness he doth what? Make war. Jesus knows that peace won't come until those who won't allow peace to happen are removed from the scene. This is true in politics. This is true in nations. It is even true in society. It is true uh, in life. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 4 says this, 
And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares. Now what the Bible is saying in this iconic thing, that they will take a sword that they use for killing people, and they will put it back on the anvil, and they will beat it until they turn it into a, 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 a plow, and then they will be able to use it for farming instead of warfare. And you think about all the money and all the things that are used now for war. Uh, one day uh, during the millennium, we may see tanks pulling plows. Wouldn't that be a wonderful better use for a tank than blowing people up and killing people? We'll see weapons of war that used to be used for, uh, for killing will be used for prosperity. It says here, they'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. There will be no need for West Point. There will be no need for Annapolis. There will be no need for all these other places where they train warfare. They will have new purposes, uh, new things that they can teach. They won't need to learn the art of war anymore because there won't be any war. If a group of people got together and decide, decided, we think we'll make a war, Jesus would stop it like that before it ever started. Jesus is going to have a peaceful kingdom. The Bible says in Proverbs 22 and verse 10, Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. You know, sometimes there's conflict. Sometimes there's trouble. Sometimes there is disruption. Uh, and, and there are times when that happens that the only way to bring peace back is to get rid of the scorner, to get rid of the problem. It's a difficult thing, but it has to be done sometimes. Jesus is going to be able to do that. The people who don't want to have peace today with the Jews will one day be forced to have peace with the Jews or face the consequences. Number three, it will be a monarchy. His kingdom is not called a democratic republic. It is not called a democracy. It is not uh, called, uh, you know, a parliamentarian government. Uh, it's not called a socialist government or a communist government. It is a kingdom that is what we call today a monarchy. Kings sit on thrones. Here he is referred to as one sitting on a throne. Now, I, I believe that, uh, uh, you know, it, it's okay to have elaborate chairs. It's okay to have things that really look fancy. But I've never been comfortable sitting on a chair that looks like a throne. Because I know I'm not a king, and I know that's not a throne. It just seems silly, you know. Uh, and I've seen, uh, you know, uh, platforms where the platform, they had chairs up here with red velvet and all this ornate woodwork and everybody out here sitting on a pine bench. And I've always thought that was a little odd, you know. Uh, and so when I was in a church like that and I was uh, called upon to preach, I would sit on the front pew until I was called upon to preach because I didn't want to sit up here on some throne. Uh, I, I figured for one thing, I figured somebody would throw a bomb at me or something. It's not a comfortable place to be. Listen, I'm not a king and I know it. But one thing I know is King Jesus is going to be sitting on a throne. That's a place of power. The government shall be upon his shoulder, which means it's his responsibility. It is his job, if you will. It is his role uh, to perform. Uh, and so he will be the king. Zechariah 6 verse 13 says, Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Uh, listen, Jesus is going to be all branches of the government in one. He will be the executive branch. That is, he's going to make sure things get done. He's going to be the legislative branch. It is he who is the lawgiver and the passer of laws and the giver of laws. He will be the supreme court because he will be the last word on any matter that comes forth. Jesus will be every bureau, and the head of every bureau will bow to, him, uh, bow to him, and he will be king of kings and lord of lords. That is, everyone who has a responsibility of authority or a power will bow to King Jesus, and things will be right as they will. Now, as I understand the Bible, you and I who are saved right now will be in our glorified bodies when the kingdom of Christ comes. The Bible get, talks about the rapture. The Bible talks about after that, the tribulation, and then the, the millennium. You and I are going to be in glorified bodies. But the Bible does say that we will rule and reign with him a thousand years. So we're going to have some kind of role in this kingdom. And you know what I'd like to see? 
I'd like to see the United States of America for once run right. I would like to see things done right just for once. And for a thousand years in this country, as well as every other country, things are going to be done as they should be. Just think about how better your life would be if you weren't taxed plum to death. Just think how much better your life would be if corruption and crookedness and foolish government did not rob us blind. Now I'm just speaking for reality. This is the, the fact we have. Every government that this world has produced has been flawed, has had problems. Uh, and even during its time of greatness, it had faults, and then it would deteriorate and dissipate and, and, and go down. Listen, won't it be right one day to be happy to turn on the news and just see good news? Well, another wonderful day in the millennial kingdom. Man, you say, well, that'd be boring. I'll take it. I'll take some boredom. Amen? Wouldn't you like to have some boredom? Every day be good. Every day be wonderful. No war. Uh, no famine. No disease. Uh, and all of these things uh, away. Listen, we'll be able to go out in the woods and play with the wild animals. Hello, Mr. Wolf. How you doing? Here's a dog biscuit. Hello, Mr. Lion. Could I ride on you? Can I put my child on your back? Oh, and, you, know, that, you, you laugh. Listen, the Bible says the lion shall lay down with the lamb and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The Bible talks about the kingdom of God that he's going to make it where all the animals are no longer fierce. Snakes won't even be a problem. Now I think it's going to be a while for our reflexes to change. Because you see a snake, the first thing you're going to do is jump. But pretty soon we'll learn, no, we don't need to jump. There's nothing dangerous here. Everything's wonderful. I believe what the Bible says. I believe it literally. I believe that when Jesus comes, it's going to be a kingdom of righteousness on this earth. Mark chapter 5, 31. It says, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. He's going to be on the throne in Jerusalem, ruling with a rod of iron. And the Bible says that it will be a great time of peace in all the earth. Number four. It will be centered in Jerusalem. And you say, well, where do you get that out of that passage? I'll tell you how I get that out of that passage. David's throne. The throne is David's throne. You, you listen, there's no other throne in the Bible where Jesus sits other than David's throne. He is the son of David. And when he sits on the throne, it is the throne of David. God made a covenant with David, and he said, your kingdom will never end. There will be a descendant from you who will sit on this throne forever. And where was David's throne? It was in Jerusalem. And that, there, who was David? He was a Jew. Who was Jesus? He was a Jew. Uh, those who want to paint Jesus and make Jesus out to be a Caucasian with golden hair and blue eyes, guess what? He was not German. He was not French. He wasn't even Irish. He was Jewish. He got it on his mother's side. Amen? And so Jesus is the Jewish Messiah who's going to sit on a Jewish throne in the Jewish state, in the Jewish capital, in the Jewish city, and he is going to rule in a monarchy type of kingdom. It will be centered in Jerusalem. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 17. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered into it to the name of the Lord to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. The Bible says plainly and in many places that the kingdom age will be centered in Jerusalem. That'll be a wonderful thing. Now I'm just going to stop right there and talk about this idea of it. There's a geographical aspect of it. There's a political aspect of it. There's a sociological aspect of it. There's an economical aspect to it. All the different aspects of a kingdom... If you were going to get an encyclopedia, you remember those? And look up a certain nation, it would have all these categories about it. It's language, it's culture, it's economy, it's government. Jesus is going to have that in the millennium, and all of this will be glorious and wonderful. It will be centered in Jerusalem. Also, it will be established in justice. Justice and judgment. Now, you know what that means? There will be no more territorial disputes. Jesus will draw the boundaries, if there are boundaries. Jesus will draw them, and they will be right. And you don't cross them with ill intent. You can trade, 
You can bless, you can interrelate, but you can't kill, you can't destroy, you can't steal. Imagine that. Imagine a world where everybody has to mind their own business. And if they do anything with someone else, it's something kind, it's something good, it's something mutually beneficial, it's something that makes everyone happy. Uh, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Listen, that alone would be wonderful for the, for the millennium, to have justice. Listen, there'll be no more bribe takers. Right now, you can get justice for you if you pay a little money to somebody. It goes on all the time. Or you make backroom promises or quid pro quo. And, and certain people can get their brand of justice while other people get another brand of justice. Listen, when Jesus comes and he is the one who is supremely just, there won't be two levels of justice. There will only be one level of justice. And it will be fair for everyone. We think also of this idea of no disputes, no bribe takers. Uh, there will be no elitists. There won't be someone who says, well, because I'm more educated or because I'm more wealthy or because I'm more politically attached that I can have favorable treatment. Oh, no. Everyone is going to be treated fairly and justly by one who is not, uh, cannot be bribed, cannot be changed in his uh, wise uh, judgment. And so another thing I think will be wonderful no second guessing, no critics. Right now, whatever happens, whatever it is, good, neutral, or bad, there's going to be critics who are going to shout long and loud about it. I just don't think Jesus is going to put up with that. I don't think there's going to be a lot of critics. I don't think there's going to be a lot of, uh, now there'll be free speech, but here's the thing, everything that you say has a price tag on it. You're not going to blaspheme the Lord Jesus. You're not going to second guess him. Now, one thing that'll make this easier, and here's the thing we need to remember. You know what makes the millennium the millennium? Part of it is the fact that Satan is bound for a thousand years. The ruler of this age, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience, the prince of darkness, he's going to be bound for a thousand years. His demons are going to be bound. There won't be deception. There won't be that, uh, that spirit that rules in the earth. And so what will happen is people will not be led into this kind of thing. They will be more likely to follow the righteous ruler. So it will be established in justice. The Bible says that uh, in Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy, thy fellows. Now I want you to notice it, it says forever and ever. Look at Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. And a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. So he is one who will bring justice on the earth. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to seeing justice. Listen, right now, in our prisons, it's sad, but it's true. There are people languishing in prison right now who were not guilty of the crime that they were accused of. Uh, false witnesses came about. People lied. Uh, the jury believed the lies, and they're sitting in jail today, though they were not guilty of the crime for which they were uh, convicted. Listen, God sees that. God knows that. Also equally true, there are people out there in our society walking around free who should be in jail. They should be in jail, but they're not. Listen, Jesus is going to correct every injustice. He's going to make everything right. You didn't really lose anything. And you didn't really get away with anything. God is going to make it right. And then lastly, we come to this great description of the kingdom. It will be eternal. Now here's the thing. You say, wait a minute, preacher. I thought you've always said that the kingdom of, of Jesus Christ was the millennium, which means a thousand year reign, that it has a beginning and it has an ending. Well, let, let me explain, okay? For a thousand years, in the kingdom of Christ, Satan is bound, his demons are bound, and the people of earth don't have to deal with that. At the end of the thousand years, Satan is released to go out and deceive the nations, and there's another war. Jesus doesn't stop being king. He is not defeated. There is no government change. There's just a contest. 
and they lose. Jesus wins. And then we come into the eternal age. So it is true. The kingdom of Jesus, though it may not be always called the millennium, is an everlasting kingdom because the kingdom of Jesus goes beyond the millennium on into eternity. Jesus will never stop being king of all the universe. He has an eternal kingdom. So Luke chapter 1, verse 32 and 33, this is the great prophecy that came there. And it said, he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. And listen to this. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And in case it wasn't clear enough, and of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Now, if I understand words, which words mean something, Okay, forever means forever. No end means no end. I don't have to wonder what the language is. It is so clear. But let's look at another one. Daniel chapter 7, verse 14. Speaking of the king and the kingdom. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that shall not be destroyed. So what we have here from the Word of God in Isaiah and other places is that both the king and his kingdom are eternal. They go on and on and on and on and never, ever end. Right now, everything ends. And listen, there's some things I want to end. I want sin to end. I want death to end. I want injustice to end. I want war to end. I want disease to end. I want sorrow to end. All of these things are going to end. But Jesus and His righteousness and His glory and His justice will never end. So let's talk about this present time. This present time, this isn't the kingdom. This is a mess that we made and are continuing to make. One thing that history has proven to us, one thing we learn from history, is that we don't learn anything from history. One thing we learn is we keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again. One thing we see is is we do not have what it takes to properly govern ourselves. We always mess up. One thing that we learn from history is we don't learn anything. This present kingdom is not the kingdom, but it's coming. Lord, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The reason we're praying that is because it hasn't happened yet. We are praying for it to come. And when it comes, Jesus is going to bring it with him. There was a school of theology that referred to uh, the millennium in this fashion that The Lord doesn't need to come physically to the earth. What's going to happen is that Christianity is going to improve uh, society and we're going to get better and better at being good neighbors and we're going to get better better at treating each other properly. And eventually we will bring in the kingdom and it'll be so good that heaven will then rule on earth. Well, listen, it doesn't take much time to realize that theology uh, falls flat. Uh, It's not working. Uh, Listen, we're not going to have the king without the kingdom and we're not going to have peace without the prince of peace. So, right now, the kingdom is just within us. Jesus is in our hearts. If you're saved, if you're born again, you're part of the kingdom of Christ. And we are citizens within a citizenship. We are sojourners. The Bible in one place calls us ambassadors. Now, you try that on yourself one day. Wake up in the morning, fix yourself up a little bit so you look good. Hold your head up and say, hello, Mr. Ambassador. That's what the Word of God calls us. Hello, Miss Ambassador. We are ambassadors to this world from heaven. We have royal blood in our veins. We are ruling in the spiritual dimension for the kingdom of Christ within a kingdom of darkness. We are shining light. We are serving as salt. We have a commission. We have a calling. We have a holy mandate to reflect our citizenship from heaven here. And it's an important task that we have. We are 
calling out to others, be reconciled to God. Come over to this kingdom. Leave the kingdom of darkness and come to the kingdom of light. Leave the the kingdom of destruction and come to the kingdom of everlasting life. That's what we have in our teaching and preaching in our evangelism. We want others to become citizens of heaven. Listen, we're ruled by a different spirit than the spirit that rules in this wicked world. We are led by a different consciousness than the consciousness that this world shares. Until the kingdom comes, we are to serve Christ and be what we should be to this world, to be a light that shines the gospel to them. It doesn't matter how small you think you may be. It doesn't matter how insignificant you think your role may be to play. Each of us who are a child of God are part of the kingdom of Christ. And the Bible says that we have the ability to make a difference. Jesus talked about his children. Jesus talked about his babes. And he said this, It would be better for someone to have a millstone tied around their neck and be thrown into the sea than for any of them to offend one of my little children. Now he was referencing little little children that were actually little children, but I believe the same principle is applied to any child of God. Those who follow Jesus who have been mistreated, misaligned, uh, who have been uh, persecuted, who have been dismissed, who have even been tortured and killed as history has done and is going on now in certain parts of the country, God is watching that. He knows what's going on. And he'll, He will reward His faithful servants when the kingdom comes. Dear Father, I pray that now before the time comes when you return to this earth, that some would hear the gospel, that Jesus died for their sins, that he rose again victorious to show that he was God in the flesh, and that all those who come to Jesus Christ in faith can have eternal life and can be ruled by heaven rather than be ruled by the spirit that rules in this earth today. Lord, I pray that we would look forward to that wonderful kingdom that's coming, knowing, Lord, that we are already part of it. It's just a matter of time. When shall be, will be when that which is spoken of that would come has come. Lord, we thank you for this truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.